This is Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We always enjoy having Don Canavi on the program. He is the chair of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. And, sir, I want to speak with you about obligations of counties as an employer. Uh, we know that at retirement, many counties, many public agencies will provide retiree health care. That has caused some fiscal pain for our county in Los Angeles. Talk to us about that. Well, let's begin by saying is overall on our pension issues that we did reform, you know, 20, 30 years mm -hmm. ago. And so we were not in a position. We didn't get caught up in the 3% of 55 right. and all the other pension kinds of issues. We had a good working relationship uh, with our labor unions. They wanted it at the time, but now they're happy they didn't get it. The biggest issue that we have from a financial standpoint as a county has been the retiree health care. Mm -hmm. And basically that's, that's a cost that has to be paid prior to any dollars being spent for services for the safety net. Why? Why does well, it that's get just paid a, first? Because it's a pension obligation. It's uh, federal law, state law. You know, that money goes into that pot before you can spend money for any other thing. So we had to really look at that. And we had to talk to our union's brothers and sisters and say, look, we need some relief here on new employees. You but, can't break existing right. contracts. But let's talk about what the current benefit provides, because that's the key. The key is the current benefit, obviously, when you retire, you get that. You get health care for, for life. The employee gets it. And, and there's what, no problem there in your mind? No, no problem there. I mean, that was uh, negotiated. I mean, that's an mm -hmm. obligation that we have. The spouse gets the benefit should the employee pass away. Okay. What was happening, though, right. and what happens right now is we pay that forever. And we're paying for folks that never worked a day in their life for the county of Los Angeles. Not the spouse piece, but children and those kinds of situations. Let's say as an example. Please. I'm married. We retire. You I get a pension, away. I pass away, my wife gets health care. My wife were to remarry and remarry somebody with three kids, we'd have to pick up the cost for those three kids. Right. And, and so, that new spouse. And that new spouse. So you have a situation, you're picking up the cost of four more people. And we all know what the family package versus an individual. So what's we've transpired, what we've done is to negotiate with the unions. And as, a, as of July 1st, what will happen is we will maintain that to the spouse but anything beyond that then they would get the benefit of our rates but they would have to pay for that out of pocket the other piece for those that are medicare eligible uh, on the new hires they will have to be forced to sign up for medicare and pay for that and then the county supplement for that health care insurance well would be based on that difference. So currently, if you are of Medicare age and you are a retiree of the LA County system, you don't have to sign up? You don't Medicare? have to. You don't have to. And even if you do, I, the difference is, is that on the new, the new situation, you would have to sign up. Right. You would have to pay that. Right now, you could sign up, you pay for it. I mean, it's a great supplement. So, but the difference now in the new form is, well, the fact is, is they will have to pay that and then the county subsidy for the remainder will be based on the difference between what they pay for Medicare. So it's it's a situation well, where they're... Will you still get that outstanding coverage? I guess I'm just trying to figure out if you're pushing folks into Medicare, which is a fine system, I'm sure, are you then pushing off the obligation? No, because you're still going to you're still going to get the health care from us, but our 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 participation will be reduced based on your Medicare participation, I understand. okay? I understand. And so this plan that we presented and been voted on and supported over 30 years is going to be close to a billion dollars in savings to the retirement system. I mean, it, it is a huge, I mean, it is groundbreaking what we're able to, to negotiate with the unions and partners. And they understand that too, because if there's a weakness on the healthcare side, that could create a weakness on the pension side. And the pension side is what the, is the one you really want to protect. It, we think about the reforms that we're seeing with pensions, with retiree health care, and for many, it, they make sense as a matter of fiscal policy. At the same time, I want to talk to you kind of philosophically about making these reforms, making these changes, because in the final analysis, there are, you take certain cuts when you decide to work for a public entity. Salaries tend not to be as high. But the flip side is, is you get outstanding perks, you get outstanding benefits. So as we've marched through the last decade into this decade, we're seeing these public agencies slowly but surely chipping away at the benefits. Yet the salaries aren't necessarily increasing to match private levels. 
Some studies may differ on that, but generally speaking, you make more in the private sector. Are you concerned that by chipping away at these benefits, you are at risk of losing the advantage that government has to lure workers into uh, public sector work? From a philosophical standpoint, I would say at this point, the salaries are much better than they were at some point in time. The problem is you also have to look at your overall budget mm. and whether it's sustainable or not. And it always has been this way. Let's say that uh, you know times are tight, so we, we don't have enough money to give a pay raise. So let's say, let's throw it into the pot for pensions. Right. And say, never ever think you'd ever have to worry about that. Well, that worry is here today, and so it has to be part of the equation. Granted, we still can't compete, let's say in the IT industry, right. we can't pay our folks what private sector people pay. Uh, but on the other hand, you make a choice. It's the stability of government, uh, the stability of the benefit, the contractual relationships that you have. And so that's still a choice. Uh, we could be on a, you know, I don't, I don't think we're going to be on a downward spiral because I still think salaries are, are from a, at least from a senior executive management, mm -hmm. are starting to be more competitive with the private sector with the benefit because our, our plan clearly is much better than a private sector. It, is it? That, that's my question. Well, I mean, it, it, it used to be really good right. and really great, but it's not that way. And it has been chipped away and creating different plans for new employees. So you've got this basis to where, you know, so there's very few people left in county government that really have what we call the Plan A, which was the original plan that, you know, you want to... Because they've, they've retired. They retired, right. and it, it, in 1978 we changed our oh, pension plan. Okay. So it's been a while back. So, I mean, from that standpoint, I still think we're competitive, but it's a choice somebody has to make, and whether they want to go on the public side or, or take their chance on the private side. At what point, though, do you feel as if we may be reaching a tipping point and the benefits do get so minimized that public work becomes that much less attractive? Well, I, I, I don't think we're there, and I don't think we're close, and I'll tell you why, because on the private side, they're taking away pension plans totally and making everybody, forcing everybody to buy a 401k or right. do their own thing. That's a totally different ball game than, I mean, the defined benefit is going away, but at least you have the opportunity for some benefit at, in county government and state government to draw down, but then you can do your 401k and decide or deferred comp. It's being forced in like the private sector saying, well, you know what, we can't afford this anymore. We're gonna shut it down, pensions going away for all new hires. So while you be making X number of dollars, might be a little bit more, you have to start at square one uh, on your own retirement. So that begs the question, if the public sector is shutting down pension obligations, the private sector is shutting it down, why should the public sector provide it anymore? Could you not argue the f exact flip side of what I've been saying? Well, that's the, that's the piece that may add to the tipping point at some point on sustainability. That could happen. That could happen, but uh, you can't break existing contracts. I mean, that's going all the way through the Supreme although, Court. Although there are measures floating around. I'm sure you know the mayor of San Jose is trying to float a measure. I think some cities have passed measures that are being challenged that would allow a change to existing plans. Whether they survive, that's another conversation. But look, I mean, should we even look at a world where the government does provide pensions for people beyond the time with which they work. Like you said, public sector, private sector doesn't do it. Well, I mean, I, the private sector <laughs> does do it. I mean, not, not, pensions, not well, as much, we're huh? not as much, not as much. That's what I said earlier. Right. I said, I mean, but when you ask me about, no, I, I, I'm playing both sides. I admit okay, it, sir. Oh. I'm, I'm, oh, I mean, that's what you're I'm doing. I'm playing both sides. Okay, all right. Yeah. But I mean, and, and I just think that uh, I see the tipping point being where pension plans in government are dramatically reduced, right? And the onus is going to be on the back of the employee, right? At that point, then the government has to be a much more competitive in salaries. Mm -hmm. I hear you. So there's a tip-off, but okay. but salaries stop, retirement doesn't. His name is Don Canavi. He is the chair of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. My name is Brad Pomerantz, and we'll be right back on Charter California Edition. The state of California will spend how much to cover retiree health care in fiscal year 2014-15? $949 million, $1.6 billion, $2.2 billion, or $3.9 billion. The state of California is expected to spend $1.6 billion to cover its retiree health costs in 2014-15. 
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are joined by James Johnson. He is a member of the Long Beach City Council. We just spoke with Don Kanabi, supervisor from Los Angeles County, and he was speaking about the challenges the county faces with retiree health care, a benefit. Mm -hmm. Long Beach faces different challenges dealing with pensions. And it takes us back to a pension benefit that was given back in 2002. Let's talk about what happened back in 2002. Well, that's right, Brad. And what happened was there were these unsustainable pension enhancements given up that we're still paying for, in fact, paying for it for decades. And they kind of kicked the can down the road, and now the bill's coming due. And but really, I want to interrupt if I may. Yeah. How did this happen? We know that in the early part of the last decade, a lot of uh, bargaining units were able to extract positive benefits, which is not necessarily a bad thing, no. but it appears that in general, as it relates to the city of Long Beach, some of these benefits were so generous, um, retroactive and uh, pro uh, looking forward, that it has put the city in a tremendous pickle. That's right. And it costs us $202 million looking back and hundreds of millions in the future. Basically, what was approved, Brad, was 33 to 50 percent pension enhancements on a retroactive basis, which means you said, hey, Steve, great job working in 1992. We're going to give you 30,000 more dollars for that year. I think that's wrong. It's wrong to give money to people for years they've already worked. And that's just common sense. How did this happen? Well, I think there's really three things uh, that happened, Brad. First of all, the council was not given the information to make the right decision. Uh, How did that happen? Well, CalPERS, you know, we're the biggest city in California to be part of our state pension plan. And every time you propose changing your pension plan, they do an actuarial analysis. How much is it going to cost? What are the impacts? So you know, are we going to have to cut police officers? Are we going to have to stop doing various services, shut down libraries? They did the plan. Uh, they did the, the proposal. They gave it to the city manager who sat on it and did not give it to the council at a public session. And the public never saw it. How? Well, I think, look, that city manager, certainly, he was getting that pension enhancement himself. Is he still with us? He's no longer with the city. And I think for whatever reason, I can't speak for him, he decided not to give that to the council. So the council was just told, this will basically not cost you any money. Well, if you're the council and you're told it's not going to be, you know, not going to cost you a lot of money, why not do it? That's the first problem. They weren't disclosed. And we know that to be true. What you just described right. that is irrefutable. That's that right. the city manager did not give them the analysis. I've got the council item, and it says it'll have less cost less than a million dollars for the next year. They didn't talk about the impact for decades to come. They didn't give them that information. The Where second, is the city manager now? Do you know? Uh, he's retired. He's, he's retired. retired. But I think it wasn't just him. I think, you know, as a city auditor, the city attorney at the time. Um, you know, another thing, Brad, is as an attorney, I know that my duty is to my client to make sure the client understands the contract. That's just fundamental. Here, there's a weird loophole and that the council may not have understood that this was going to be a retroactive enhancement, not just for future years, but years already worked, which How? is counterintuitive. Well, there's a loophole in CalPERS law that allowed you to make it retroactive. And I think the council, if, if I told you I was going to give you a raise, wouldn't you think it's for the future years' of work? That's just, so I think the council may have thought the same thing. I think the city attorney, if I'd been that city attorney, I would have explained to the council, hey, there's a loophole here. This will be retroactive. This will cost you $202 million and lead to cuts in services. Why weren't they told that? They, weren't, they didn't have to be? Well, uh, that leads to probably the third question. It was not legally required, but I think, Brad, ethics is about doing what's right, not what's legally required. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think the problem was here. But the final issue was there was a conflict of interest. The previous city attorney, everyone in his office, the city manager, the very person proposing this deal, they were walking home with the same pension hand since themselves. Several of them walked home with a million dollars or more in their pockets that night. So I hate to say it, but I think that may have skewed some of their advice. Were they giving the advice on what's right for the city or what's good for their own personal pocketbook? And I think as a lawyer, if I were a city attorney, I would ex expose those conflicts because I think ethics requires you put it on the table, let people know, hey, you know, the people are proposing this are going to benefit themselves. So what can be done to prevent something like this from happening in the future? Well, Brad, I actually went to Sacramento and uh, met with folks up there and lobbied our legislators and said, look, in the future, we should never allow a retroactive giveaway again. Any kind of enhancements in the future have to be for future years' work. I'm proud to say the city of Long Beach was the first city on my motion to make that motion, and state law did change. Okay. So now the good news is this cannot happen again. But what about the lack of transparency? How do we make sure that future 
city attorneys, city managers provide the city council with all the information that should be provided, especially a city council that's part-time, which they are in Long Beach. Well, that's right, Brad. Well, one reason I'm running for city attorney is because I think that office needs judgment. And as the next city attorney, what I'm going to do is always disclose all conflicts of interest, even when the law doesn't require it. I'm going to make sure that the council knows that if they're giving me advice, right. this person has a financial interest. But that even, needs to be disclosed. Even aside from the conflict, even if we don't presume that there is a conflict. Mm -hmm. I just don't understand how the city council was not given all this information. How is that not legally compelled? What needs to be done to legally compel whomever is responsible to provide relevant information? Well, Brad, we have a system of checks and balances. And the reason we elect a city attorney, in addition to the city auditor, we elect them to basically protect the public purse. And I think, you know, one thing that didn't happen here, in my opinion, the city attorney didn't stand up and say, right. hey, this is wrong. Here's the issue. Here's the advice to giving you. I mean, the city attorney is the primary advisor on all legal matters, and contracts are fundamentally a legal matter. So I don't know if we can legislate a fix here. Right. I think really it's about choosing the right people who are going to stand up for the public interest and not the special interest. So here we are, and the Long Beach City budget is in decent shape, but what we know is that come 2016, these uh, proactive enhancements are really going to kick in. And in five years, from 2016 to 2021, Long Beach will see its obligations spike by $35 million. That's that right. is a huge number for a city, even as large as Long Beach. And just to put it in perspective, Brad, we were told we'll have a choice. One choice is to cut 153 police officers. Another choice is to basically eliminate all our libraries and all our parks. Those are horrible choices. Yeah. Or we could radically raise taxes. What I'm saying is we need to have another choice. The other choice is to reform these pensions to basically prevent the problem. But I just had, don't but think. You can't reform on a retroactive basis. Well, I think what you need to do, Brad, is I think you need to go to Sacramento and say, look, are we going to allow all these cities in California to have their pension costs double? Or is there another solution? Right now, the law does not allow other changes, but I think you could make changes such as current employees. What are they going to accrue in the future? That's something that could be looked at. Well, um, I mean, that's, or, a, that's a very significant debate. I mean, as you know, the courts have held that you cannot change the benefit of a current employee unless it's mm -hmm. negotiated. That's right. Uh, well, and as maybe I mentioned, should, yeah. you know, the San Jose mayor is looking to change that. Some cities have passed initiatives that are looking to change that. But as we stand today, I mean, you're a lawyer. Th that would be a big change. That's right. Well, look, and I do think these, a lot of things should be negotiated. I believe that employees should be treated fairly. But I think the question is, are we going to allow cities to go bankrupt? Or are we going to find another solution? I don't think the city of Long Beach is willing to basically lay off 20% of our police officers. Mm -hmm. We've already done We've already done that. We've already cut 20%. So I, I mean, think the question it, is, what's the other solution? It is Brad? interesting you say that because when we look at the city of Long Beach, in the last, I think it's five years, the city of Long Beach has cut almost 800 employees. There's not much more cutting that can be done, one could argue. Well, that's right. And that's what I'm saying. You know, we used to have 1,000 police officers. Now we have about 800. Can we really go down to 650? I mean, that's my question. Is that the Long Beach? Do we want to live in a Long Beach with no parks department, no libraries? So we need to be fair to our employees, but we need to sit down with them, collectively bargain and say, you know, what can be done? You know, I, I believe in a city that has employees on the job providing services. Well, are your, and that needs, are you know, your that bargaining that. units going to listen? I mean, wh what's their incentive? I think their incentive is they want to come to work. And I think their incentive is they believe in the city and they believe in public service. You know, most public employees do it not just for the paycheck, but because they believe in coming in and making that city better. Because you'll day. be asking them to give up a significant amount of money that they believe that they are entitled to based upon this 2002 deal. But you know, Brad, you can't squeeze blood from a stone. And I think if we don't make some changes, the sad truth is I'm not sure the money's going to be there to pay off some of these pensions. So I think we've got to reform to basically honor the promises we've made. Have they been engaged yet on this issue, the bargaining units? I think it's early. We just got this information this week. Okay. Uh, but we need to look at that. Okay. His name is James Johnson. He is a member of the Long Beach City Council. My name is Brad Palmer. So I want to thank you so much for joining us. We'll be right back on Charter California Edition. What is the value of the California Public Employees Retirement System, or CalPERS? $239 billion, $277 billion, $323 billion, or $361 billion? 
Kelpers, the world's biggest public pension fund, maintains assets of $277 billion. It's Charter California Edition. Welcome back. I'm Brad Pomerantz, and we are joined by Jeff Kellogg. He is the president of the Long Beach Community College District. I want to speak with you about a groundbreaking program. We've spoken about it before, and that is the ability of six college districts to create and offer intercession classes that would be in the winter and presumably summer mm -hmm. for impacted courses at a higher rate. Right. Talk uh, to us about it. Long Beach was the first and only so far. The uh, first and only one that offered among the six. This was part of the legislation that was uh, by assembly member from the Santa Barbara area. Das Williams. Uh, mm -hmm. And we are the only college that took that and actually did enact a classes to be offered during intercession. Well, let me ask you, if I may, if you know, why? Well, why are you the only one? Well, it, a lot of which was political pressure. Many of the, uh, including the last one, San Bernardino, uh, the community college district out there, uh, they Crafton had a, Hills. a term, correct, one, mm -hmm. of the, one of the colleges there. Mm -hmm. uh, they had the opportunity to enact it as well. Some of the college districts also weren't prepared to do it. Uh, they didn't have the qualifications that really they could do it this time. They may do it in the future. But in, in the case of San Bernardino, a lot of political pressure because it's change. And nobody wants change, especially in their own district. As I understand it, Pasadena, PCCD, they've said no. They said, Even though they're on the list, they've said no. And they wouldn't have qualified at the time, but their, their president and superintendent just said, no, we're not going to do it. I think Oxnard... No. They were also another one. They said no, and they were part of Ventura. Uh, and interesting, I talked to a, one of the trustees from the Ventura Community College District, and he said to me, he goes, Jeff, what you're doing is absolutely right, but I'm not willing to stake my political future on it. There's that much anger about it? I think there's concern among trustees that they look at themselves out politically first, college second, and that's why I have to give a lot of credit to the board at Long Beach. Right, which I understand, but, but what you're offering, arguably, is the ability for a student to graduate sooner right? because a class is impacted, so they have to stick around longer. Right. Yes, they may need to pay a little more for the class over the winter, but wouldn't it be cheaper in the end than sticking around for a whole extra semester a year? Uh, absolutely. If you want to come to our next board meeting and discuss this <laughs> item, feel free to, because most people are talking about how it uh, goes against the community college system with $46 a unit. It's more. How but much there, more? Uh, it, can, it varies. It was up to a couple hundred dollars a unit mm -hmm. versus our $46. Now, the breakdown industry, when we did pass it and we did enact it, and it has taken place now, 97% uh, of the courses that we were offered during the last winter session were filled. So 97% oh of them were filled. Mm -hmm. Out of that, the breakdown of the students, which we wanted to look at as well, it mirrored the exact student population that we currently have at Long Beach City College as far as their, where they are. Age, their, range, their, ethnicity, all of that. socioeconomic. And, and the interesting part also is the people that took out financial aid. Traditionally, Long Beach City College, about 62% of our students have some type of what we call bog waivers. Uh, it's financial aid. Uh, this class during the winter session, it was 57% of the students that took it had bog waivers. It mirrored exactly what we had before. It was a success in that regard. It'll happen for a few more years, uh, and then it sunsets. So uh, we were- How many students total, do you know? About well, I, uh, it's, it was a it was hundreds a, it was, or thousands. It was, no, it was a couple hundred. hundred it was a couple okay. hundred because it was a limited curriculum. Because right. by the time it got through all the legislative process signed by the governor right. and supported by the governor, with quite frankly, a signing statement. How often do you see a gubernatorial signing statement? No, he, he was adamant. Usually, you see a veto statement, but not a signing statement. Right. So he was. He felt it was a it was a fair idea that needed to be considered. So. We found it to be very successful, and uh, we're going to continue it because what I tell people, it gives students an option. But what about the argument, and I think it's a fair one to discuss, mm -hmm. that it creates two classes? Well, it, it creates, economic it, in the, for economics, what it does is you are offering courses at a higher rate. The fact is we wish we didn't have to do that. The way that can be resolved is if the state of California allocated more funding to the community college system that we could offer more classes to help address this bubble of students that we have huge wait lists. That's not going to happen. Well, though. we know that these are better days fiscally in yes. California, and we do know that community colleges will be seeing more money mm -hmm. as a result of Prop 30 and a better economy. But if you look at the governor's priorities when it comes to education, clearly he gives his 
strongest stamp of approval to K-12. I mean, that's where he's yeah. sending most of the large yes, Correct. I guess you can Correct. say. Not to 13-14, not to CSUUC. But the biggest, in his proposed budget, the biggest issue that he presented in there was actually almost $600 million to the community college system to essentially bring the debt down. That, the money that we've been owed since 2007, it just keeps compiling year after year. Is, is UC part of Prop 98? I misspoke. Is Community College part of Prop 98? Yes, it is. It's a, oh, it's, wow. a, it's, it's a small percentage of Prop 98. I want to say it's 11 to 13 percent. So it's not huge in that convoluted formula they utilize. Mm -hmm. But yes, we are part of that. So we do get some more funding on it, but still not the level that we need. And so that's the whole question we're rolling back to why we did the intercessions. We're trying to offer students the option to try and move forward. The argument always is going going to be that in many people's mind, community college should be free mm -hmm. or close to free. Uh, $46 a unit, it's more expensive than when I attended community college, but, but it was free. Tr interestingly, it is in terms of comparing to Very, the other 50 states, oh, 50th. It, I mean, you know that. Yes. Right it, now, California is the cheapest, yes. the least expensive community college the, la the largest system in the United States with uh, 112 community colleges right. out of approximately 1,200 community colleges nationwide. We are still the cheapest, but the fact that many people look at it that way, that they're not going to change anything, but we do, we have to change, and we are changing to address the needs of the students, and this was a, not, not it, it was a component, it was part of the puzzle, but it clearly is not the only piece. So how did you decide what courses to offer in the winter? It, it, there actually was a list of that, and that was the courses that had the highest demand over the past few years, the wait list. I see. The courses that were most impacted over the last few years, those are the courses that you ended up, you you right. you then offer. were qualified to, to offer those, and what that's exactly this, what we did. What about this summer? Some of the same scenario. So will It'll there be expanded be, the curriculum though, much more expand, will, much larger amount of offering of courses. Will there be a regular summer session? Because we know during the recession, yes. often summer sessions were cut completely. Right. So will there be regular summer session and then this kind of we're, intercession we're, rate? We're anticipating there will be a regular summer session as well. Both? Yes. So how does one decide what gets charged the well, higher rate? I mean, some people, if they want to take the, take the chance and try to get a course, even during this, this semester taking place sure. right now, it's just, it's, again, it's an option for them. And right. uh, it's just one that sits there. And our, our biggest issue is going to be, are we going to get more funding for more access? Because that's the key, key element right. for community colleges today. You're running for re-election. Mm -hmm. And so I want to talk to you about- 20 years I've been doing this. Uh, I was this. going to say, as a city council member in Long Beach, yes. uh, you ran for mayor as well, now mm -hmm. community college district. You're walking. And as we've discussed, when you're walking for assembly or Congress or city council, the conversation may be a little more easy to strike up. Right. What do you strike up when you're running for community college district when you knock on the door? Well, for me, a case of a lot of people know me because I was born and raised in the area. Right. I did represent the area on the city council for, for 12 years. Right. So uh, sometimes though they ask me if I'm still the city council right. member. Which <laughs> Even is, though it's been how many years? Since 2000 nice. when I retired yeah. from the nice. city council. 14 years. Uh, it's a good question because with those other city council races, you can talk about sidewalk curves, planes, right. trains, automobiles. The community college, you're really just talking about more of how the college impacts their area uh, or, or their, in their lives. That's what I end up talking to them about. Do residents realize that LBCCD is actually one of the premier districts in the state? Do they know that? I think more people understand that than they, but the problem is during campaigns, right. the other side of the equation when people run, people don't run against an incumbent like myself saying, he does a fine job, but I can do even better. They will always talk as hard negative as they can, right. and that is the college has gone away from his its mission statement, and they will list a lot of things, which are, is tough during a campaign because the college is one of the finest colleges in the country. Are you being attacked for supporting intercession? Not really. Interesting. No, not, I, it, people will ask me questions about with vocational programs. Right. That's the one thing that they've heard about in the newspaper quite a bit. They'll ask me, but in fairness, all the years I've walked, and I walk every campaign, I can probably count on a hand minus a finger and a thumb <laughs> the people that have been really rude. I've never had that problem. If they don't agree with you, they're going to say thank you very much and you move on. But nobody's ever basically threatened to throw me off the porch. His name is Jeff Kellogg. He is the president of the Long Beach Community College District. My name is Brad Palmer. It's this is Charter California Edition. <laughs>